everybody, today is our lecture number 13 and today I would like to talk about CCS. CCS means Carbon Capture and Storage or you better say Carbon Dioxide Capture and Storage. Next lecture we will talk about the black carbon sequestration but here it's the sequestration of carbon dioxide. Before I start with the lecture on CCS I would like to give you one general remark. A remark about sustainability. My basic message about new technologies is that if you have a new technology and you think it's a great thing, you should check if this new technology does not produce more problems than it solves. This is an obvious statement of course, but in reality I think this is not always the case. In my previous lectures we had already two of those technologies where I myself said it would produce more problems than it solves. Example number one was nuclear power as explained in lecture four. Example number two is fracking as explained in lecture six. And today in lecture 13 we discuss CCS. And to my mind we have the same problem here. We should not introduce it at large scale because there's a big chance that it produces new problems. In my previous lecture I explained you the global carbon cycle and there we mentioned already CCS. So if you look back to this rather complex diagram which had two basic deposits where carbon in big scale is stored. The one on the left is the storage of CO2. So this is the storage of the burnt gas. So it's CO2 in a rather inactive inherent chemical form. And on the left side you see the deposit number two. This is where carbon in its pure form or in an almost pure form like in coal is stored or also biomass houses and so on out of wood belong to this storage. And today we discuss the part of CCS so we can reduce the diagram to the main components here. So we have the fossil fuels which are used in industry. They are burned at large scale and they go into the atmosphere and there they produce global warming and acidification of the oceans. And these two bad things we want to pretend and then people have the great idea to invent CCS. So what is happening there, it's very easy. You continue to use fossil fuels, but you don't release the exhaust gases or the CO2 into the atmosphere, but you collect it and store it somewhere where it's safe. So this is in principle a very good idea. This is shown in more detail in the sketch here. So it explains quite easily the steps which are necessary for CCS. So first of all, you burn your fossil fuel, then you produce CO2. You capture the CO2 in your power plant, for example. You normally liquefy it to compress it to a small amount of volume. And then you press it either into the soil or into some deep aquifer, some groundwater, or you put it even into the ocean. This is in principle all very logical and simple, but I would like to explain where I see some of the problems. By the way, in this diagram you find a few additional things. First of all, you can put the CO2 into ponds with bacteria and there you grow bacteria faster from CO2. Secondly, the, you can put it into underground coal beds. There the CO2 together with the coal can in principle form methane. And what is quite often used is to use CO2 to and press it into gas or oil reservoirs and you use that either to press the remaining oil and gas out of the reservoir or you just store it because there's space available. So now let's come to the details. Here you see my favorite coal power plant. Actually it's a lignite power plant. It's close to where I was born and when I was a child I could go there by, by bike. So this was about 20 kilometers away from my home 
And for me as a child, this was a big cloud factory where these clouds came out and distributed around in our neighborhood. The first somewhat disappointing aspect of CCS is that it does not work for small CO2 emitters. Because that would be really great if you have your car and you produce your CO2 from your gasoline, you would like to capture it. But the CCS capture method is so complicated that it will not work for small engines. It also does not work for your heating at home. So this is the first negative point, but let's continue and think about how it works for big fossil fuel powered plants. Well, here the next point is that, of course, unfortunately, you need quite a lot of energy to apply this carbon capture and storage. It reduces the efficiency of a power plant, depending on the technology, by something like on the order of 9%. So if you have a 45% efficiency in your power plant, that means uh, you need about 25% more coal or gas. This is already a significant amount of additional fuel you need to use this technology. Some people even say you need something like 50% more fuel. Of course, it might be improving in future, but whatever you do, this process is energy intensive. And you also have to think about that in addition to the sequestration, you also need to transport the CO2 away from your power plant to an area where you can get extracted. Okay, now the third point, <coughs> which is important, is there are two different technologies for CCS. The first one uses just a standard burning process. The fossil fuel is burned and CO2 comes out of the chimney. However, in the chimney, there's not only CO2, there's some what of water vapor, of course, but mainly there is nitrogen, the nitrogen from the air which was burned. So you have to find a chemical method where you process your exhaust gases in a way that you take out this 15% of CO2 and you leave out the rest into the atmosphere. This is working there, are big projects funded by the governments to process that and there's a lot of progress there so this is in principle possible. There are power stations who are able to do it this way. There's another method which from the purity of the concept is quite nice. It's called the oxyfuel combustion. There you don't burn the fossil fuels with normal air but you burn it with pure oxygen. And the nice thing about it is that what comes out is, in addition to the water vapor, pure CO2. So it's much easier than to take out the CO2 and to sequestrate it. Of course, here the problem is you have to get pure oxygen, so you need energy and technology to prepare the pure oxygen for your power plant. The next point then is if you have taken out the CO2 from the other gases, you normally liquefy it or you can also make it solid if it's cold enough and then you have to transport it to an area where you can get rid of it. There you have to think about that the weight of CO2 is about three or four times larger than the weight of the original fossil fuel. So if you have one ton of coal and you burn it, you add the oxygen, so each molecule becomes heavier so at the end you have maybe three or four tons of CO2, which is liquid, which is cold and which might have a very high pressure. So it's not trivial to do the transportation because for that then you would need either fuel trucks which carry it away or you need pipelines, both maybe under high pressure and or at very low temperatures. So it's a non-trivial task to do the transportation. And then the fifth point is that you have to find an adequate storage for your CO2. Typically you use geological formations and if possible you should do it in the vicinity of your power stations 
you don't want to transport your CO2 across the ocean to another continent. So now I come to the risks which this technology has. If you do the storage of CO2 and you do it underground, well, you, all those things can happen which always can happen. You can have leaks in the pipes so that you lose CO2 into the air. CO2 can escape in principle from the reservoirs even if they are underground somewhere. If the CO2 leaves the ground, it comes up to the ground level and there it comes in contact with uh, life as well underground like bacteria and small animals. But also overground, it can harm people overground. If you do the sequestration in water, so there are, for example, deep, deep water aquifers where you could just put it. If these aquifers have no contact to the groundwater or to the ocean, then of course this is in principle safe. However, you never know if there will not be a connection later or already at the beginning, so that this uh, carbonate acid then leaks out into the groundwater or into the ocean. There are also people who say that they want to press CO2 deep into the ocean because of the high pressure, it's basically stable there. But of course that is also not finally safe. If CO2 comes out of the ground and it, then it can leak into the houses of people, into the cellars. CO2 is a very heavy gas, so if you put it somewhere it flows down into the cellar or if it comes down from the ground it stays and accumulates in the cellar and it can also accumulate in caves or in other depressions on ground. So in this case then you get much higher concentrations as in the air which might be a problem. I always say CO2 is a killer gas and in the next slides I will explain you why I call it a killer gas. So why do I say CO2 is a killer gas? Well, first of all, CO2 is not really poisonous. Yeah, you can inhalate it because anyway there is CO2 in your lung. Normally you breathe it out, but um, in this sense it belongs also to the human body. So it's not a priori a danger. And of course we all appreciate all the drinks with hydrocarbonates. So if you drink a Coke, um, this will not kill you, of course. So why do I say it's a killer gas? Well, first of all, it doesn't smell. So if it's in the, your room, you cannot really smell it. It's invisible. And as I said before, it accumulates in the ground. So if you go into the cellar or if you have, um, if you are outside and there's a valley somewhere, a narrow valley without any wind, and you would accumulate CO2 in this area, then um, this might be a problem for you. Why is it a problem? Well, you can only live in a surrounding of CO2 if the concentration is less than a certain percentage. Normally, as you know, CO2 in our atmosphere is far less than 1%. If you increase it to, for example, 8%, then it kills you within less than one hour. So in a minute I will explain you the mechanism behind it. First, let's have a few examples. So you know there are quite a few people doing YouTube videos and a lot of them are not about energy lectures, but for example, what people like to do is they put dry ice into a pool of water. What happens there? Well, dry ice has a temperature of about minus 78 degrees. Celsius. So it's very cold and if you put it into normal water it gets warm and then the dry ice immediately becomes CO2 as gas and this has an expansion factor of 760. So you really get a lot of volume from a little bit of dry ice. It makes this nice clouds here. The clouds come from the effect that the air is cooled down by this cold CO2 and then the water vapor uh, makes 
some clouds. Normally this is of course fun, but sometimes it happens that people breathe in too much CO2. There is one YouTube example uh, where there were afterwards three people dead just by CO2. So even if CO2 a priori is nothing dangerous, at larger concentration it kills you quite fast. This happens also regularly to people who transport in their car dry ice because if the car is closed, there's not enough air exchange. Then what happens? This factor of 760 of the volume expansion of dry ice puts all the CO2 into the car and people in the car die from it. It also happens in wine cellars because also the wine production or beer production produces CO2. It happens in wells and many other examples. You might also know that pigs in many countries are killed by CO2 gas chambers. So they bring the pigs into these gas chambers and as soon as the concentration is high enough, then the pigs die. So why is CO2 dangerous to a living animal or to a person? So the main reason why CO2 is so dangerous is because of the following process. If you are breathing, you take oxygen in and you breathe out CO2. This works in your lungs. But what happens inside of your lungs? Well, inside of your lungs, you have the diffusion of your oxygen molecules into the blood and the diffusion of your CO2 molecules out of the blood. Why do they diffuse through into the blood and out of the blood? Well, behind that, you have to know a little bit of physics. Each of these gases in this liquid, so in the blood, have so-called partial pressures. And then there are membranes in the cells which let the oxygen and the CO2 molecules pass but they don't let pass other molecules, for example. And the driving force behind this exchange of gases is osmosis. So probably you have learned this word osmosis in school. It is a physical process which you can understand from the molecular motion of the molecules, from the semi-permeable membranes and the partial pressures behind it. What is happening in gases happens also in liquids. So you see on this picture here, if there are two different kinds of molecules in a liquid and at the bottom there, you have a semi-permeable membrane. What happens is that if just one of the two molecules can go through the membrane, uh, the, like in this case here, the blue liquid can go through the membrane. So it will do it even against uh, an overpressure on the other side. And this is the osmotic pressure, which comes from, as you could call it, the um, willingness of the molecules to have some motion and to pass through whatever is possible. And they pass through this semi-permeable membrane there until on the other side, uh, the partial pressure of the same kind of molecule is the same. Now you can imagine the blue liquid would be the CO2 gas in your body and outside of your body there is no CO2 or almost no below 1%. So the CO2 comes by itself out of your body and it comes out with your breath. If now in the outside there is also CO2, the opposite direction happens as well. So the CO2 from outside goes into your blood and increases your blood concentration. And these membranes and these molecular processes then control how fast these things happen. And the acting force in this process is the osmosis. And osmosis only works from the side with the higher pressure to the side of the lower pressure. So if now you go into a room where there's a lot of CO2, then the blue stuff in this picture here is also on the right side. And if you have on the right side blue stuff and on the left side blue stuff, uh, there is no reason for the molecules anymore to change this equilibrium. So as soon as on the outside world there is also CO2 in a certain pressure, in a certain concentration, then the CO2 will not leave your body anymore. 
and if CO2 doesn't leave your blood anymore by itself, then uh, all the cells will stop working because all the cells in their body have to give their CO2 to, your, to the blood and if the blood is saturated to some extent with CO2, um, this does not work anymore. So this 8% CO2 in the outside world is already too much for a human body. So all the cells will die and also the person will die. Yeah, you don't die immediately. Normally you get unconsciousness before. It seems not to be the case for pigs. They, pigs really get panicked before they get unconscious in the slaughterhouses. But it doesn't finally matter. If the CO2 concentration is above a few percent, uh, you cannot live in this environment anymore. Those accidents happen not only in closed rooms, but also outside. So it happens in certain valleys that there is an over concentration of CO2 and you su suddenly find dead animals lying around. But there was one event in 1986 in Africa, Lake Nios, where this happened in a bigger scale. So in this, this lake is a volcano lake and volcanoes also emit CO2. And people found out the lake is saturated with CO2. So there's the maximum on CO2 which you can put into water is in there. And then suddenly something happened. Suddenly a lot of CO2 was emitted. And in this event, 1,700 people were killed and thousands of animals were killed up to a distance of about 27 kilometers. So there was a cloud of CO2 coming out of the lake. And because CO2 is so heavy, it doesn't go up, but instead it flows on the landscape and fills the valleys around. And at this time, then so many people were killed. Of course, fortunately, in this area, there are not so many people living. If you would imagine this happens in the middle of Europe at some, for some reason, of course, um, the effect would be even worse. How did the CO2 come out there? Well, probably what can happen in this respect is that as soon as there are bubbles coming out, the density of the water becomes smaller. And once it becomes smaller, then there's even more CO2 released because there's not enough pressure from the water there anymore. It's a bit like if you open a bottle of Coke and the whole CO2 is coming out as a big fountain. Yeah, so in this respect, such a lake could, it can in principle, when it's saturated with CO2, suddenly emit a lot of CO2 without any obvious reason. So this might explain you why I'm hesitant to say that CCS is a good technology, because in, imagine you are working with megatons of CO2 underground somewhere and something happened, the effect can be enormous. And that is my last point of the slide here. So it's always nice to develop a technology in your lab and to do some prototypes and be happy if it's working. But it's a big difference if you do something in your lab or in a single industrialized country, or if you say this is a new technology which has to be distributed over all our globe then you are not talking about a few bottles of CO2 anymore or a few barrels of CO2. Then you are talking about megatons of CO2 every day. And if there are accidents, and there will be accidents all the time in this scale, then of course this is a very dangerous technology because this technology is not inherently safe. It is inherently deadly in a way. Yeah. So this is my argument why I say um, it's a nice technology, but it doesn't fulfill our safety requirements. If you don't do it at large scale, it's not important. If you do it at large scale, then there's no control of the risks. Yeah, it's a similar argument as I had for nuclear energy, for example. Another nice picture I have to show you in this respect is here. This shows you a long queue of trucks, 130 kilometers of 
traffic jam in a way in the desert Gobi. This is all lorry drivers which have coal on their lorry and they want to transport it to China. And due to some reasons, the traffic is slow going into China. So there are large queues and people waste half of their life in these queues just to transport a little bit of coal. And this is only the coal. Imagine now you have to do sequestration and you have to get rid of the CO2 which you produce with all this coal. Then you have a factor of three or four more weight to carry. So for every of these coal lorries, you need three or four tank trucks to bring back the CO2. And then you can, I think, imagine that this technology is a nice idea but will not work on large scale everywhere in the world. Personally, I think it would be very much more intelligent to use this desert Gobi to produce solar power, as we will see later in this lecture series. That brings me already to the end of this lecture on CCS. In the next lecture, I will show you a much better way of sequestration. This is not sequestration of CO2, carbon dioxide, but it's sequestration of black carbon. So you don't put CO2, but you put carbon back into the ground. So hope to see you in my next lecture and I wish you a good day. Goodbye.